Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Welcome to the third annual Higher Education Webinar sponsored by the College Teaching and Learning Science Postmaster's Certificate Program here at UMBC. This year, we, are, have, we have a co-sponsor, the Faculty Development Center at UMBC. At the end of the presentation, Dr. Jennifer Harrison, the Associate Director, will be asking questions from the faculty discussion of Dr. Miller's book. So welcome to our series on the issues in higher education. My name is Dr. Eileen O'Brien. I'm the director of this online college teaching program. The certificate program sits within the Department of Psychology and is administered by the Division of Professional Studies. This certificate prepares new graduate students, current faculty, or those who are transitioning to college teaching to enter into the college classroom ready to reach our diverse student populations, design quality courses, use authentic assessment of learning, and deliver courses in varied modalities. Although our online program is based in the state of Maryland, our students and topics for this series reach nationally. So welcome to our attendees and other time zones. In addition, our Faculty Developmental Center is committed to state-of-the-art instruction, and many of our own UMBC faculty are in attendance. You will see a QR code during the presentation that provides easy access to a resource web page that Dr. Miller has created. This presentation today is relevant for faculty in two-year colleges, four-year colleges, and graduate education. Today's faculty tend to steer clear of memory and memorization in classrooms, preferring to focus on higher level thinking skills. But do these goals have to be mutually exclusive? New research suggests that teachers really can have it both ways, using research-based techniques to strengthen both what students know and their ability to use that knowledge. Now, many of these approaches fit particularly well within educational technology, as well as with newly available AI tools. Dr. Miller invites us to look at a new way of approaching memory, highlighting technologies and techniques that help students build a solid base of knowledge efficiently, quickly, while enjoying the process of learning. Dr. Miller is a cognitive psychologist, researcher, and speaker focused on supporting higher education faculty in creating effective and engaging learning experiences for students. She is the author of Minds Online, Teaching Effectively with Technology, Remembering and Forgetting in the Age of Technology, Teaching, Learning, and the Science of Memory in a Wired World and a new book she was mentioning, forthcoming in fall, A Teacher's Guide to Learning Students' Names, Why You Should, Why It's Hard, and How You Can. Dr. Miller is a professor of psychological science and president, distinguished teaching fellow at Northern Arizona University. Today, the title of her presentation, You Must Remember This, Using the Science of Memory to Support Learning in a Wired World. Without further ado, this is Dr. Michelle Miller. And welcome. Uh, it is just wonderful to meet this group today. We have been working for uh, months to really envision how to bring some of these concepts and some, some new ideas, new connections that have arisen just since the publication of the book two years ago. Uh, we've been working uh, since last fall on this, and it is amazing to have this coming together today. So as you heard, I'm a cognitive psychologist by training, and so that is where uh, my perspective comes from. And, and yet I have worked worked for now several decades at an institution that really prizes teaching and has been a very fertile ground to look at how can I take some of these key findings from my field and even from some of my own research and bring those and put those in the hands of people who are working with our incredibly uh, deserving and talented students and help them achieve their dreams for their education. So that's the spirit that I hope that it, you'll see comes across today. So uh, we are going to get going and give you a sense of uh, just where we're going to be, what we're going to be covering and how we're going to be approaching this today. So we are going to start with uh, kind of setting the stage for 
why memory is important for teaching and learning in higher education. And this was something that really uh, was on my mind as I sat down to write this book when I got the opportunity to do so is this idea of and this tension of, well, is memory even a topic we should be talking about? Um, and I had long noticed that there was this very interesting thing that happened when I started talking about memory, which to me as a cognitive psychologist is such an interesting idea. We know all this stuff about it and some faculty were really uncomfortable with this. So since I'm a psychologist, I had to dig into that and say, why are we uncomfortable? And but why is this still an important topic? Then we're going to get into some principles of memory that I think all teachers, no matter their discipline, their level, their focus, all teachers should know. Um, and then we are going to uh, look at some concrete applications. So what are some ideas for how to take some of these principles, which you may have already read about um, and that we will be reinforcing, and uh, use those to create new creative activities that will benefit our students and really fit our style. And we will have um, now for the, the first time um, since the, the this book came out, be connecting some of the concepts to um, AI chatbot tools um, in particular, since that's on everybody's minds these days. All right, so that is what to expect. Now, as mentioned, I put together um, a very simple uh, companion website for this talk. So I am a big believer in sharing the sources and really the research backing for the claims that I'm going to make. Uh, that said, it does not make for nice slide design to have all the references and everything everywhere. And in the interest of time, we can't possibly explore all the different facets that I would love to. So this is something um, that you can visit any time. And it is something that uh, I'm not a web designer, you'll, you'll see that, but this is made uh, just through Google Sites. And so I've, I've found that that is a really great tool for students to use as well. So uh, check it out. Um, again, we won't be kind of referencing or dipping, dipping in and out of this site specifically during the session, but it is hopefully a resource that you can um, visit anytime. Okay, so with that, we are going to start our time today with a little bit of a thought experiment, and it is one involving memory. So I'm going to ask you um, about something that, especially if you grew up in the United States, you're probably quite familiar with. So I'm going to ask you about it, and it's going to be a little bit of honor system. We're going to see if you can remember it without referencing any external sources. All right, so this question for you has to do with the United States Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the First Amendment to the Bill of Rights. Um, so the First Amendment has five specific parts to it. And so I'm going to ask you if you can, without referencing any sources or <laughs> pulling out the handy computer in your pocket, whether you think you could remember all five of them. Now, if by chance we have anybody here today whose specialty is constitutional law or is teaching U.S. government, you get to sit this one out. The rest of us will possibly struggle with it a little bit. Um, now, think about it. This is something you've seen before you may care about quite a bit. So can you remember all five parts? And feel free to post in the chat in just a moment uh, whether you think you got all of them. Okay, so everybody's had a chance to think about it. So before you do look it up or uh, go for an external source, um, if, we, if you'd like to post in chat which parts of the First Amendment, the rights guaranteed by the First Amendment, were you able to recall, if any? You can give us a number. You can type in the specific ones. So let's post in chat. How did we do this? OK. Speech, religion, can't remember the rest? Yes. <laughs> OK. Three. All right. All right. We got two. We got three. Uh, all right, very good. So we've got a couple. Uh, and when I when I ask folks this in in a in a live setting, this is pretty typical for what I get as well. Okay. So here we go. Speech for assembly. Okay. <laughs> So we're on the right track. However, most people will find that it eludes them. So feel free to go for an external source. And whoever gets there first in the chat, go ahead and, and post what you get. We'll get there. As a, yes, we'll crowdsource it. 
Right, so anybody get all of them just yet? The last two are really, really slippery. Okay. So we do have, all right, religion, speech, press, assembly, and the right to petition the government for redress of grievances. Okay, very, very good. Okay, so now this is this, I, I love this example. Um, I actually picked this when I saw a survey that came out several years ago um, that showed that 97% of the uh, adults that they surveyed who lived in the United States could not name all five. So uh, the, the point of this is not, oh, we, we don't know this and we should. Uh, this is very, very typical. But it really does uh, illustrate, I think, in a pretty dramatic way, some of the quirks about memory that uh, do flow into all the principles that we'll talk about later today. But uh, it's also a good opportunity to reflect and say, you know, introspect, as we would say in psychology, what was going on as you tried to answer the question? So any kind of subjective impressions, no right or wrong answers here, any subjective impressions of what it was like to be asked this question and to attempt to answer it? So any impressions that folks might post in the chat? Yeah, okay, so you were aware that there was some time pressure, right? Okay, so it definitely probably felt uh, challenging. Um, you may have had a very active sense of searching, searching your memory. That's what many people will find. And you may have found it a, a little bit frustrating, although hopefully it helped to know that other people were experiencing the same thing, right? <laughs> because you, you knew you could look it up online. Uh, yeah, the, the, the context, right? You were not expecting to, to hear this uh, particular question, no doubt. Uh, trying to visualize it. Oh, okay. So that's also a, a concept that's close to my heart that we'll touch on later. Um, and yeah, trying to visualize a document. So just being in the situation of being asked a question does produce some very specific and very active mental processes. And again, a theme that we will definitely revisit later today. And it also illustrates for me too, um, just that you can see this many times, that poster board that uh, folks were mentioning may have been up in their classroom and you may have seen it many times. And yet in this situation, you weren't able to recall it in full. And uh, I know for me that it, it brought back memories of teaching in, in classrooms, um, especially the first 10, 15 years of my teaching career at Northern Arizona University. We actually had at the time a mandate that we had to have the United States Constitution posted on a plaque in certain classrooms. And I, I would be proctoring exams and, kind of uh, at the front of the classroom, killing a little bit of time. And I'd lean up against the wall and I would read the plaque over and over. And yet, even even I, the first time I tried to answer this question, couldn't come up with it. And, and by the way, if you really want to stump somebody, ask them about the Third Amendment and their position on that one. And I'm just going to leave that one there. <laughs> okay, so now that we've kind of primed the pump with what are some of the complexities that go into being able to remember um, any given piece of information on any given occasion, I want us to take on this idea that for most faculty, I mean faculty, I've now gotten to speak with, with hundreds and hundreds of faculty about this, and I love to ask them in their discipline, what is, I guess you could call it back of the hand knowledge, that if you're going to be successful, in a given area, if you're really going to be able to, to move on and really perform at a high level in a given discipline or field, what are some pieces of information that you need to be able to remember? Not go for your phone, not ask Google, but it's really going to be better if you actually remember. So this is another opportunity to post in chat, so hopefully we will get some examples here. Um, and if you uh, we would like to tell us what your discipline is, if it's not going to be obvious from your answer, uh, go ahead and do that too. So what are some pieces of information that students in your discipline really need to be able to remember? Um, just right off the bat, don't look it up. What are some examples of that? I can, I'll, uh, while, while you're thinking, I can throw out one of mine. I know uh, from teaching research methods and statistics in psychology, 
Um, one of the things that I realized pretty early on that students did need to actually memorize was the cutoff for statistical significance, <laughs> so 0.05. And if you've ever run a statistical test, you know what I'm talking about here. And students would sometimes be like, is it 0 0.50? Is it 5.0? And I realized this was actually going to trip them up. And memorizing it doesn't let you know conceptually what statistical significance is, but it's really, really helpful. OK, so we have some response here. Initial steps of CPR. Oh my goodness. I, I will just say I <laughs> absolutely endorse that. Um, theories of psychology, right? So the, the names of the major frameworks of psychology. OK, ah, and if you teach in a uh, foreign language or uh, learning second languages, um, vocabulary and grammar rules, right? You can look them up, but that's going to slow you down. Um, basic vocabulary and definition of terms, right? And I know if I were if I were teaching a, a class in United States government, I would probably like my students to have at right at the ready um, key information such as uh, the, the components of the First Amendment. All right, so we can all answer this question. That's that's really what I've seen is I've gotten out there and talked to faculty. Faculty will give me all kinds of, of uh, answers to this question and say, you know, if students want to go on in nursing and electrical engineering uh, in chemistry, this is what they need to know. And yet we get this resistance. Now, uh, if you if you were able to check out um, the book that we're kind of uh, referencing today, you know that I talk a lot about this here too. But here again, what does what happens when we go to our fellow faculty and say, oh, hey, memory and memorization is important in my classes. You will sometimes have folks who look askance at you or maybe you yourself have a, almost a visceral reaction to the idea of memory or memorization as part of the the teaching and learning um, that you're you're working to accomplish in your classes. So, any examples of what sort of resistance arises, either that you agree with or you've you've simply heard? So, we're going to have memorization in my class. What is the resistance? What sorts of things will folks say, or what is the pushback? that happens. Anything come to mind here? Ah, critical thinking. I love it. Yeah. So there, there is this um, idea, um, and I've heard it too, it's a very deeply resonant idea for many faculty that I want critical thinking, right? And if I'm focused on memory and memorization, that's not going to happen, right? Memorization replaces understanding. Yeah, so my students might memorize the cutoff for statistical significance, but do they really understand what inferential statistics and in those tests tell you and what they don't tell you? Maybe not. Okay, so there is that. So there, there's uh, kind of become a, a good amount of baggage that's uh, attached to this topic in teaching and learning in higher education. And I, I always feel like these come from a good place, right? If you really are, are wanting your students to be able to critically think and apply what they know, that is really, really good. If you're concerned that over-focusing on memorization will replace understanding, that's also a really good concern. Or even if the, the idea is like, well, this is going to be stressful for students um, and I don't want to add to that, that's also a good thing. But I think that there are, from the research, quite a few kind of comebacks to this that we should consider as well. And that's what I'd like to share with you um, next. So here are some claims, too. So I do think that simply on the face of it, it's a practical reality that memorization of some key information is needed for what I've come to think of as fluent practice in a discipline or profession. So if my students are running statistical tests and the, <laughs> the program is spitting back all these results, um, they can stop and, and look up key terms and, and ideas before interpreting that. But every time they do that, is a, it slows them down. It brings in opportunities for mistakes. And, and I'm thinking of the CPR <laughs> example that was shared here as well. Um, if you are going to be um, in an emergency situation with pressure going on, uh, and you need to, to carry out a particular action right away in sequence and correctly, then yes, there needs to be some memorization that happens there. Um, so, so there is that. 
But there's also, um, when we get into the technology angle, there's also some interesting uh, concepts that come out of recent research, which again, you know, I really foregrounded in this in uh, the latest book. And in particular, the so-called Google effect or cognitive offloading. This is one that uh, I've got a little placeholder up here on the screen for the seminal study that that put this idea out there, uh, made this discovery initially. However, this has now been replicated um, by other studies and in other contexts. And basically, it, it says that if you assume that you can grab your phone and look it up <laughs> um, any anytime you need that piece of information, um, even if that is on an unconscious level, like you don't even realize you're doing this, that makes it slightly less likely that your your mind, your brain, will choose to, to store that information. And it kind of makes sense, right? We know that our minds and our brains are really geared towards um, being very efficient, right? Conserving all resources um, above all else. So of course, your mind, your brain says, oh, handy shortcut. If we can look it up somewhere else, I'll just remember where it's found online. I won't remember the piece of information itself. And this is not always a bad thing. However, if you think about our students um, kind of accrued over hundreds of, of pieces of information they're seeing in, in dozens of different classes, you can see that this could undermine um, what you what you're going to learn over time. So yes, it's true in the contemporary era, pretty much any factual piece of information you need to know is at one's fingertips. However, um, that knowledge can sometimes uh, be a, a double edged sword. And we also now know um, from from several kind of very interesting uh, pieces of lines of research that are coming out in cognitive psychology that um, there, we, we need to reexamine the idea that memory, memorization, knowledge is kind of sitting in opposition to the ability to use that knowledge, the critical thinking ability. So this is something that we are still exploring. There's still a lot to, to, to learn about this, but I'm very encouraged by some, some early research showing that the more that students know in a given area and the more strongly those memories are established, actually the better able they are to think, extend, and make inferences, for example, in that area. So I think it is time to start questioning this um, ourselves to say, well, does it have to be this tug of war between these two processes, or can these really work together in a more organic way? So that's another kind of counterpoint to think about. And we now have so many uh, research-backed strategies. We've got decades now of applied memory research geared specifically to looking at how to increase um, the development of knowledge in academic areas, realistic settings. Um, we know so much now to where it doesn't have to be an either-or choice of, well, if we're going to be memorizing facts, that's all we can do. We can really fast-track um, memories and knowledge for our students if we have the right techniques. So that's what we're going to pivot to now. So those, as promised, the memory principles that I think all teachers should know. So out of this uh, several decades of applied memory research, what really floats to the top to me as the most usable, uh, most, uh, you know, solidly replicated pieces of, uh, pieces of knowledge that we can have about memory. So I'm going to share those with you now. So when I talk to faculty about memory, um, it, it, I usually don't like to actually start with lots of theories or diagrams or things like that. I think it really starts with a mindset, right? A mindset. So it's, I would invite us to really reflect on what we think memory is and how we conceptualize memory in our own minds. And so especially if you've, you've had some background in psychology and you've maybe been exposed to some of our older uh, textbooks and, and standard uh, kind of theories in this area, you may have gotten the mistaken impression that uh, memory works like an assembly line, right? That your memory is sort of this container where you put information comes in through your senses, maybe it goes around and what you may have learned with short-term memory, then it gets shipped off to long-term memory. And this is a very sort of mechanistic um, concept of memory that doesn't take into account um, this more ecological or functional idea of, of memory, of why does memory exist in the first place? 
So I encourage us to think about memory not as a place to put things, but as something your mind and brain can do that helps you accomplish other goals right so when you do that a lot of things really crack open it sort of starts to explain like why didn't I memorize the parts of the First Amendment all those times when I was leaning up against the wall and looking at them well maybe there wasn't a really good reason my, my mind and brain didn't pick up hey this is really relevant um, to what you're needing to accomplish right now so that's what I think is, is first of all very important. We remember essentially what um, our brains and our minds cue us are important to remember. And we have certain ways of figuring that out, but that's a, a big framework that I think is really, really helpful. Um, and similarly, um, it is, it's quite clear and very agreed upon by theorists right now that memory is not a recording device. And it doesn't really behave like one either. So we don't walk around with a GoPro in the brain that just sort of takes in whatever's in front of us passively and just replays it later. Um, we are very, very selective in what we take in. And we take in things that are going to help us. And then it comes back as well in terms of the context, which is a concept that came up earlier in our chat. So our minds also like to serve up information that's going to be relevant right now and so when I look around me and hear some cues that's when the memories come flooding back if you've ever done something like go back to your old elementary school you've seen this principle in action so we take in what's going to be relevant and goal directed and, and useful to us and we bring it right back when we feel like oh, okay clearly the setting matches um, this information that I've learned so that's a big one now beyond this, here are some other really solidly established principles. Um, so things like depth of processing, right? So this principle, we've known about this for a very long time. It essentially says what you do with information at the time that you are first encountering it or processing it um, has a lot to do with whether you'll remember it later. And so so-called deep processing has to do with meaning. And this is something that the teachers, I think, typically hit on even if they never learn the formal terminology for it. So um, if, for example, I were to present my students with the parts of the First Amendment and said, okay, I want you to go through and rank order these in terms of, of why they're important and explain to me why they're ranked that way. Or I want you to think about back to your own life and when is a time when you yourself have accessed these different rights and let's talk about that that is going to be a bigger kind of impetus to later memory than say just sitting and looking at it because it's on a poster board in in your room um, and this this is a really good thing by the way too because it sets up this nice kind of positive or virtuous cycle when I think about things deeply and actually apply them I remember them if I remember them I'm better able to apply them so there's that. And then there's this other um, principle, distributed practice or spacing. And this too, I think, tends to be fairly intuitive for most of us. And it is, it's another one that we um, have a very, very good sense of in terms of why it happens and uh, just how solid of a principle it is. So distributed practice or spacing has to do with the timing of study. So essentially, if I'm going to spend an hour studying the Constitution, um, I'm going to get more out of that from a memory standpoint if I split it into two half-hour sessions or four 15-minute sessions and so on. So encountering information over time, revisiting it, coming back to it is beneficial for memory. And then visual superiority, which what do you know also came up in our chat as well. So uh, possibly because the brain has so much kind of uh, computational power um, and anatomical structures um, due to that are devoted to vision when we can visualize something we do tend to remember it a little bit better so that cheesy clip art graphic that I showed you of the Constitution if I showed you that in a year you would probably know that you had seen that that picture before uh, you might not remember a whole lot else of the uh, content around it but you would remember that so those are some really really solid take-home principles and then there is this one. This is like the, the biggest success story in um, applied memory research for, uh, for the last 30 years. And it is also a success story in that more folks are um, aware of it and applying it than I ever thought that we would see. And this is retrieval practice. So retrieval practice is, um, of course, the act of trying to pull something out of memory. So not just like reviewing it or looking at it, 
but actually trying to say, can I remember this without, uh, without a cue? So it produces this thing called the testing effect, which is this benefit in memory. And when I say it's a benefit, um, retrieving something, actually trying to answer a question about it, uh, from a memory standpoint, gives you better results for time invested than anything else you can do with that time. And we make very, very few definitive claims like that in psychology, and that's one. So this is such a powerful idea. And so especially when you stack it up against what for many students is their go-to um, study strategy, you say, what did you, what did you study when you say you were studying? That is rereading. And we're not talking about going back and like annotating or, or really doing something super substantive, interrogating a text. We're talking about the highlight fest, right? I, I looked at the book, I reread the book, and it's insidious because it gives you a sense of familiarity. So students say, I feel like I was learning, but if you actually look at it systematically, um, they are learning very little from rereading. So closing the book and saying, okay, I'm going to ask myself five questions about what I just read, that will get that material to stick. So that's what we're finding. And this is also one of the, the links that we're seeing between memory and higher thought processes. So again, this is one that's still emerging, but um, for example, this uh, study, which you can find on, on the website, and, and I have a placeholder here for as well, um, when we, uh, when researchers um, use retrieval practice in laboratory studies of learning, when students use retrieval practice, it more solidly establishes the memories and, and knowledge for key facts that they're going to be tested about. And not only do they remember better, they have a better ability to transfer that into a new setting, which as teachers we know is really challenging, and extend and make inferences about it. So to me, that is, that's what I think of when I say, yeah, memory and, and thinking can work together. They don't have to be in this tug of war with each other. Okay, so retrieval practice is great. Uh, you may have already seen some great resources about it. Uh, retrievalpractice.org is a fantastic uh, free site that has all kinds of ways that you can tap into retrieval practice as part of your, your teaching. And so we are actually going to try this ourselves. So again, without re re referencing any sources or reviewing in the chat, does anybody feel like they could get all five of the... Uh, of those principles that we queried you about at the beginning of our time together? Anybody think they can get all five? Okay. All right, we are, yeah, we're really, really close here, okay. So th this is what I hope you get from that demonstration as well, is my gosh, uh, with, with one trial, uh, with one attempt, one being put on the spot one time to try to get this out of memory, uh, that may have done more for building your knowledge of, of that print of that set of facts than all the exposure you've had up to this point, right? And if you do have any other thoughts about why you think that was, now that you've had that opportunity to to, to try it again, um, feel free to post that in chat. But I also wanted to to let you know as well. That especially if you got it wrong, as you probably did, most people do, um, the first time you tried, what you may have just experienced was something called test potentiated learning. So retrieval practice is so powerful that it can even create a kind of a receptive window for reviewing information um, that you've just tried to answer a question about. So normally rereading doesn't matter. Normally looking at that plaque with the First Amendment is not really going to help you that much unless you just tried to answer a test question about it. So it's, it's so powerful that it can even activate learning in the near future. So this is something that clearly I think we can, we can tap into um, in lots of creative, creative ways to help our students. So that's what we're going to take on now in this uh, next section of our time together. So looking at some tools and techniques with the purpose of hopefully everybody can find at least one thing that appeals to them and that they really think that they can use going forward starting today. So some tools and techniques for helping students build knowledge and, and strengthen their memories for course material. 
Now, of course, I, I love technological uh, tools. I love bringing in new technologies that do things like let us tap into retrieval practice. And we have more of these than I ever thought we would. Um, but there are also some very low tech ways to do this as well. So some ideas that we will, we will start with here just to kind of get the creative juices flowing. Um, if we've got any Kahoot fans in the house, <laughs> feel free to uh, put your endorsement in the chat as well. Kahoot, um, I think it, it has really taken um, educational world by storm in its own way. It's great because it does one thing and it does it really well, uh, which is run gamified quizzes <laughs> Yes, in the classroom. I love it. And when I first saw it, I said, oh, my college students are not. I mean, this is kind of the primary colors and the music. Come on. But for some reason, students do really get into it. Even my graduate students love it. Um, now, I, I when I use a Kahoot in, uh, say, an online class or even face-to-face -face class, I, the, it is required to do them, although we have alternatives for students who say don't want to bring a smartphone to class. I like to never grade on the basis of the little score that Kahoot uh, spits out. Instead, I have students do a reflection. So they have to do the Kahoot, but then they they, uh, just turn in a couple of sentences saying, hey, I did better than I thought I did, I would, or wow, this really revealed that I need to go back and study this chapter, and so on. So there's, there's even ways to turn it into a graded activity without kind of um, having the issues that come from the fact that it is gamified, it's competitive, it rewards uh, not just accurate answers, but fast ones, which for some students is going to be a little less accessible. So that's a great example, but uh, even things like Quizlet, giant banks of, of flashcard questions. Uh, I keep thinking I'm going to have to take Quizlet out of <laughs> out of my rotation of examples, but then my students will say, oh, we did a Quizlet, and so it's still pretty relevant. Uh, and more complex products like Top Hat. Um, I have a, I mentor somebody who's a big, big fan of this in larger classes, so it has ways to ask questions on the fly, again, give students credit for participating, and even have some different options like um, open-ended questions which can also be a really good alternative for some things that you're teaching. Uh, and even things in Canvas, repeatable uh, reading quizzes, you create a bank of quizzes and uh, a, ba a bank of quiz questions and draw out of that randomly. Um, students, I love to give students unlimited attempts and just keep their highest grade. And I say, well, you know, if you got 100 on this, why would you take it again? And they go, oh, right, because taking the quiz helps reinforce the memory really efficiently. Yes, I get it. So all of those are at our, at our disposal. But even low tech things like the brain dump and pair share, take out a piece of paper and write down everything you can remember that we uh, touched on last week in class and then turn to your neighbor and see whether you have the same list. Love it. Ah, great. And we've got a poll everywhere. Fantastic. Uh, and if you've got access to the, uh, the more premium features through your institution, so much the better. Um, student created quizzes. So if you're sitting there going, oh no, how am I going to make all these quiz questions? Well, um, I've also had students uh, just turn in on an index card at the beginning of, of class, tell me three different questions about the, the reading material. And then guess what? Next time we come in, I pick uh, the best of those questions. We've got a quiz. And I don't even grade those. I say, well, you made up the questions. Why don't you all figure out the right answers? Uh, so that can, can work well, too. So again, retrievalpractice.org also has lots of great um, ideas and starters with this. Now, right at the bottom of our screen, though, this will be something which will be in, uh, increasingly familiar to many. Um, prompts and using AI to tap into, again, some of these memory principles. So we have a, here just a very uh, simple little example of a, of a, a prompt that I used um, to, to generate some questions on an article I wasn't sure if I understood. And so here's where we are going to, as promised, um, have a, a brief um, detour or another little section uh, with some suggestions and a few concepts in review um, that have to do with, with AI. So basics for teaching and learning with a particular focus on memory, retrieval practice, and applying what you're, what you're learning, so deep processing. Now, a right, little bit of a, of a disclaimer here. This will definitely be review for some folks. Um, 
you could definitely have a day long workshop on some of this. So we are going to just activate a few concepts that may be review for some of you and establish some basics that may be new to some of you as well. Um, so definitely right now, people are at very different levels of, of understanding and experience with this, and that is absolutely fine. So a few key features of, of AI, again, just to work up to how could we use this um, to reinforce the concepts we've talked about so far. Now, what I've really been struck with when I, I started getting into AI and using chat GPT and so on, um, and I've seen with my fellow faculty as well, is quite naturally, just as a cognitive psychologist would predict, we approach this new tool using some uh, skills and habits that we've developed with other tools, in particular Google. So I think it's it's interesting to kind of think, okay, how is it different than, than say, uh, Google? And one of the big things for me was to say, really what you're doing with AI is giving it instructions, not asking questions. I mean, you can ask it questions. You can say, oh, uh, hey, can can U.S. citizens retire in Spain, or you can you can ask it things, um, but it, that's not really where its strength lies, right? It's the strength lies in giving it prompts, which are sets of instructions, which may be very short or maybe very long and extended. And I, we say it's not that great at just answering decontextualized questions, um, as you may know by now. AI chatbots are, are trained uh, in large language uh, models are trained at a point in time and not always very recently. So they, they aren't even maybe that dialed into the current internet. So if you just have a question that's very timely, um, closed ended question, what's happening today, then Google is probably a better bet. Um, you can provide it your own material. So let's say I wanted it to do something with an article that just came out last week. Well, it's not going to be able to find that on its own, but I can provide that for it and say, hey, this is the material I want you to use to carry out these instructions. So instructions, not questions. And context is also so much more important. So as you interact with, uh, with an AI tool, you're going to see that its purpose, its goals, how it addresses your, your questions and how it carries out those instructions are going to change and hopefully be refined and get better over the course of a, section, a, a session, un, again, unlike Google. You can do things like set time sensitive conditions. That was a new thing for me as well. So you can say, do this until, um, so I would like you to not tell me the answers to these quiz questions, only give hints until I tell you the quiz is over. And it, it's able to do that. Um, and explaining the roles, the purpose, and the goals does turn out to have a pretty drastic impact on how it addresses your instructions as well. So I find myself using the phrases act as or pretend to be quite frequently. Uh, so instead of just saying, here's a question, answer it, say, what, what perspective are you coming to this from? So uh, act as a student who's going to look at these instructions and tell me if they're clear. Um, pretend to be an editorial assistant who has expertise in applied memory theory. So giving it those kinds of context is really key. And uh, really far and away, this, this little uh, phrase has been so helpful to me as I've gotten into this, role, goal, instructions. So role, goal, instructions. When you're crafting a prompt, a set of instructions to give it, uh, who are you? What's your perspective? What is the goal ultimately of this exchange we're having? And then how do I want you to go about it? So with all that in mind, um, here's another uh, QR code you can grab. If you haven't seen Ethan Mollick's work um, in AI right now, especially AI for teaching and learning, I would consider him one of the best uh, sources that we have right now um, for this. So he's got a, a free sub stack and a newsletter and so on that you may want to check out. Um, but just some of the things that he said, just a very, very basic framework of what can this even do that might be relevant to our teaching is uh, AI tools are very good at summarizing, distilling, and explaining. So they're very good at kind of pulling out main main points. Um, that can even be from one's own work. I've, I've tried that with things I've written to say, hey, this is what I meant for this to, to get across. Did it, did it actually do that? 
uh, it's wonderful for generating quizzes. What do you know? Retrieval practice. So it's it's very good at generating uh, as many questions as you want using whatever source material that you give it, uh, any format, and giving you the answers as well, and giving you feedback, and finding and explaining errors, too, in input that you give it. And anytime, um, it, you know, we can it can generate content. It can generate, uh, as you as you know by now, graphics. Um, it can also generate written content too, and it can help you improve content if you give it specific instructions. So I think for teachers, we're going to see a lot more uh, creative ideas and people running with these basic capabilities. Now, when we sat down in advance of this this uh, webinar today and thought, okay. What specifically might map onto some of these concepts we've talked about today? Here are some ideas we came up with. Now, this is a lot more text than I normally like to put on a slide. So I'm going to give us a moment, let you read these over, uh, with the idea that these could be for retrieval practice specifically and also for application, so actually using what you're learning. So I'll let you read those over for a moment. And feel free to post in chat if there's any that uh, you would really gravitate towards or perhaps you've even tried. Uh, feel free to share that with the rest of the group right now. And you can see quite a few of these do have to do with just straight up retrieval practice, generating quizzes. But this scenario that I put together at the end, um, I, I kind of had research methods on, on my mind when I was uh, thinking about this, and probably for many of you as well, if you're engaged in social science research or education research right now, um, either for scenarios to give your students or practice or something like that. Uh, you could have it put together uh, a scenario intended to illustrate something called ceiling effects or floor effects, so research and statistics measurement concept. Um, so you could have it put that scenario together and ask students to identify what the problem is, maybe come up with solutions. Uh, similarly, something like construct validity. I mean, it's one thing to read about that in your textbook. Uh, it's another thing to say, okay, uh, let's, let's role play, you just got this uh, feedback from reviewer two for your manuscript that you just uh, submitted to a journal and they say we really want you to explicate or, or address how construct validity works in your study. What would you say? Or practicing what we do when an IRB application has been denied. So um, you can have it even uh, give it instructions to not give the answer, say, hey, this section is weak or uh, there's something missing from here. You can say, well, don't give, don't give the students the answer. Go back and forth and help them identify the problem. So role play, absolutely. I, I love the idea of bringing in role play and I do think we are going to have a lot more folks doing this systematically and I just, I just can't wait to see how all that plays out. All right, so those are some basic tools um, and a refresher, some example ideas for how we might use these. So here is a segment that where, I, where I've set aside the next five to ten minutes um, before our Q&A to actually create some space and an opportunity um, to, to share as well for applying some of these concepts we've learned about today. So here's what I would like to invite everybody to do. Um, on, on, on your own out there. Um, so it's really a two-parter. We'll, you can get as far as you can in the time we have. But using, kind of thinking about today, what is one idea that you have for strengthening memory for important course concepts using retrieval practice? So very kind of granular question. What would you take away using retrieval practice? And then, um, what's an idea for helping students really apply in a substantive way what they're learning, right? So uh, reinforcing the retrieval practice, most powerful tool we have so far, and then application, all right? And feel free, I'm going to go ahead and uh, advance to the next slide, but uh, feel free to share as you go or ask questions as you go in chat. Um, if you do want to share in chat, it might be nice to tell us what, what concepts are we talking about. And also, did, uh, what, uh, gra what kind of um, piqued your interest more, high tech or low tech or somewhere in between?
So can we, we're going to set, uh, I'm going to set about five minutes and an opportunity to think, brainstorm, and share in chat as ideas come to you. All right, so we've got a little under under a minute um, here, so let's have some sharing here. So we have uh, this example of stereotype threat, which, you know, I think we'd have students probably retrieve and make sure we know what stereotype threat is, but then to pivot straight to, and how have you experienced this and what was that like, right? Students might remember that for a lifetime. I know I probably would if I were asked that. Um, ah, okay. Right. Okay. Ah, uh, critic. Uh, I think I have not used that one myself yet, but uh, this thing probably hangs together with a lot of these new annotation um, tools that really let you go beyond just the like, okay, read over here, then jump in a discussion board and post one, reply to two, but really making it very immediate in a way. So here we go. Uh, so our timers, timers going. Um, all right. So that is good. So high tech, right? Retrieve and repeat what they know by grading each other's information too, as well. Yeah. So and, and I, I I always love it when students are more in that active role of hey, there's there's no real magic. I, you know, my expertise is important when I evaluate your work. But as you become an expert, then that's something you can be doing as well. All right, very good. Okay, so definitely feel free to post other examples you may have come up with. And again, I, I do hope that we have, that you, you come away with some notes that you can start using right away to, to benefit students. And faculty themselves um, are always the best source of ideas and sharing and support for each other. So that's part of why I love to, to go at it this way as well. Okay. Oh, and we have um, warm up questions. Yes. Yeah, so remember setting the context can can really make or break retrieval sometimes. Um, so putting us back in that flow of, okay, what were we talking about? What were we grappling with? Um, and then connecting it to new learning for the lesson of the day. Okay. Exit tickets. Oh, those those are really really good too um, and they help you if you're tracking participation and attendance that's really really practical um, and then you get this this uh, really up to the moment sense of where your class is at in terms of, of understanding okay all right share strategies they already they already use to get their mind sinking through application, right? And and that brings about some of those positive emotions too, that pride of like, hey, the, the teacher actually uh, said that my, my technique was good and shared it with the whole class. Okay, and then write down three strategies they're going to try, right? So uh, it's one thing to be told, oh, retrieval practice is good. And then another to say, go and try it for yourself. And once you do, you're, you may never go back to your old, just uh, highlight and, and cross your fingers and hope. Yeah, okay. Well, great. So we are really right on track for um, where I'd hoped we'd be in terms of your incorporating some of these ideas and sharing them with each other. So I really appreciate that. So what we're going to do now is we are going to enter our uh, Q&A uh, phase here. Um, I'm going to put, we'll come back to our Q&A slide. I do want to just reinforce a few other things before we go into that and be able to leave that information up for those who may still need it. So. I, I again the ideas for for books and new studies and new talks always comes from from faculty and students working right now so I really do hope that you all will uh, accept my invitation to stay in touch uh, LinkedIn is is really where I'm at in terms of prof professional social media right now so feel free to find me on social media uh, on LinkedIn um, I have a free Substack newsletter that uh, discusses new and emerging research in the field. Um, also feel free to sign up for that if you'd like. And always feel free to shoot me questions at contact at michellemillerphd.com. So I love to be able to expand my network with the folks who are here today. Here's uh, the QR code for that website if you'd like to see that one more time in case you didn't get a chance to grab it the first time. And with that, let's Head back to our Q&A. Thank you so much, Dr. Miller. Really appreciate your presentation and all the insights you shared with us. 
um, as we mentioned early on, we had a faculty discussion group, mm -hmm. who read the book and talked uh -huh. about it, and they came up with a great question for you, and here it is. Okay. The Ebbinghaus Research Forgetting Curve shows us that memory declines the sharpest within 20 minutes of initial learning, and then after an hour, our memory loses about half of the new information. How does the forgetting research inform your remembering research, and how can we minimize forgetting? Specifically, what strategies interfere with forgetting and therefore encourage remembering? Right. So, oh my gosh, uh, yeah, this is this is a good one. Um, and forgetting itself, as you may have picked up from the book, um, it, it is it has been the source of some really heated debates. I mean, nothing could seem simpler on the face of it, right? Um, use it or lose it, just decays. But there's actually some really intricate questions too that have to do with, okay, how much is straight decay of information, especially if it's not retrieved, and how much is overwriting information? Um, and this whole overwriting concept, by the way, if you, I mean. I think probably for many of us, the most salient example is, um, you know, when you start a new semester and you do learn a new crop of names of your students and we're good to go. And then in walks a student from two or three semesters ago and you, you're like, ah, and you're struggling. And, and so the mind also has these very hyper efficient mechanisms for saying, look, uh, if the context is class, I, I really want to keep irrelevant stuff out of the mix, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna actively get rid of some of that. So, so uh, I would say even stay tuned for for even what forgetting is. Um, but I think also having that functionalist or more ecological view is also helpful here. I think it's it is important for us and for our students, and frankly for some of us as we're entering middle age and beyond, <laughs> to see the functional value behind forgetting, right? So we, it's very easy. I know even for me as a specialist, very easy for me to say, ah, if I could only remember everything, right? If I could only remember every single thing that's out there, uh, you know, life would be perfect. <laughs> um, but there are some real downsides to that as well. And that might actually, if you want to, if anybody wants to throw some of their ideas for that in chat, um, go right ahead of just like, Okay, but what are the problems that would occur if we if we just sort of remember everything? So, um, forgetting can be positive when it does reduce irrelevant connections. Um, when uh, under time pressure, I'm not going to come out with the wrong student's name or the wrong CPR procedure because now there's a new one and I've learned it. Um, that that's a, a positive for forgetting, um, and I think organization as well. Um, this is why when we have true experts in an area, uh, like my husband, who who uh, I, I wrote up in in the, in the older book Minds Online, I wrote up what his knowledge structures are for basketball. <laughs> Um, you know, there are some things about basketball he will never forget, not because he's not getting older like the rest of us and maybe doesn't think about, uh, you know, uh, some of the, the, he doesn't think about um, Dr. J or, or an older basketball player all the time. That's all happening, but because he has this rich, well-organized, interconnected knowledge base in this, which I will never have, <laughs> um, that can help support. So if one connection's a little weak, you say, ah, oh, who did Jerry West play for? Um, how did this come about? What what was the big rivalry that happened in the 90s? Any one of those single connections could get a little weak through forgetting, um, but it's going to get so much from every everything else that's connected to it. So when you have that rich, well-organized knowledge base, you're, you're really in this great position um, compared to me who has this little superficial knowledge like I can go through and memorize a list of basketball players names but when that starts to go it's just going to go it's going to fall apart in a much more um, kind of severe and less graceful way so you know I, I appreciate the idea of we have this forgetting curve there's some very systematic things about knowledge in isolation we can say oh yeah we forget it it tracks but I kind of like to look at it in this more holistic way. Yeah. So, so yeah. <laughs> what a question. Oh, and we have another hand. I'm sorry. I do have a question. One of those um, issues with regard to students taking a formative course, maybe an intro or a research one in spring, then they don't do anything but work or have fun in the summer. And then they come back in the fall. Yeah. yeah. And it's as though, 
it's obliterated. Did they ever take research one? Um, what kind of strategies yeah. would you recommend? Yeah, so some of this, I, I, I like this question because it kind of does illustrate once again that what we traditionally think of as thinking or higher, higher order cognitive stuff and memory is a little bit more messy and, it, and entangled than, than you might think from, from uh, some of the textbooks. Um, okay, so there is strengthening very key memory, you know, pieces of knowledge to begin with. Um, again, retrieval practice, if you want something to last for more than a week, more than two months, more than three months, they've done the research and re retrieval practice is a great way to do that. But to me, it's also an issue of transfer, which again, we, we've usually thought of that more in the higher order thinking of, okay, you learn something in one context, can you take it into the next context? Um, and, you know, transfer is this massive issue and it's like if, if students can't transfer let alone over the summer but into the rest of their lives like what are we doing as educators so um me so i would say getting ahead of the the issue so if i'm teaching research one and i know research two comes in the next in the sequence uh having having a cumulative exam i know these can be a little fraught there's some ups and downsides to those but making sure that the key things they're going to need to hit the ground running next time get reinforced on the way out the door as well. Um, and then the transfer part of it. I mean, transfer is tricky because our minds are so context specific. So it's partly that students, yeah, they're, they're not doing anything with it and it's sort of a perfect storm of forgetting over the summer, but also that now I'm, I'm sitting in a new class, it's got a new number, maybe a new teacher, my brain is going to mislead me to say, well, this is a blank slate. Let's start from zero. Okay, who remembers anything from Reach's Run? I remember nothing. Well, it may be in there, but it needs to be activated in, in a new way. Um, so providing context at the beginning of the second course, and kind of like going back to your elementary school and be like, oh my gosh, now I remember the name of my first grade teacher and my best friend. So providing some context that helps and kind of using some of the, the bags of, bag of tricks that we use for transfer. So having students really grapple with difficult problems, messy problems, but ones that reinforce the same kind of things over and over, um, again, could help us get ahead of that problem. But, but yeah, I love the question because it takes this theoretical stuff and turns it into this really practical, practical thing. Because who hasn't been really frustrated at the end of August when they're standing in front of that class and you know they've done it and, and you just can't reactivate it? Yeah. Trisha. Well, I think for us, if, if for us to kind of retain these things and take them to heart, uh, I think kind of staying focused on our goals as well. And it really is about our students um, and helping them, you know, get to a place that maybe they never even envisioned they could be at. I, I, that's that, I know that's what keeps me going and animates this um, whole field for me as well. So I really hope that that's uh, where you all are going to take it as well. And I'm going to turn it back over to our facilitators. Well, thank you, Dr. Miller, for an exceptional session today. I know we've read the book. I'm you know, chewing over again about <laughs> note taking and how note taking yeah. by hand might be the better way for memory encoding and maybe ultimately retrieval um, as one of the learnings from that textbook. So that's been really helpful. Uh, Dr. Miller's book is available online, and the link should be appearing in our chat as well as in the link to the CTS program, our college teaching program. We appreciate everyone taking the time to join us and showing your commitment to enhancing student learning. We'll be sending out reminders for next year's webinar in early March of 25. So thank you, Dr. Miller, again, great webinar. Thank you so My much. Pleasure. And everybody, have a lovely spring day.